The Altar of Incense is a title of our message taken from Exodus chapter 37, verses 25 to 29. It was at the right hand of the Altar of Incense in the Holy Temple in Jerusalem when the angel Gabriel appeared to the priest Zacharias announcing the birth of John the Baptizer, the forerunner of Christ. We are in this series where God shows us the heavenly blueprint of His throne, whereby He minister and He administer and He ordains all things for His glory. And He gives us a semblance of how we can fellowship with Him, how we can know Him, and what He does in the throne room of God in heaven. And there was the priest Zacharias when the angel Gabriel appeared to him in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. For he had no child. His wife Elizabeth was very old, the womb barren, and they were now stricken in years. And so, while he was executing the priest's office before God, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense. Can we see a picture? Down? Further down? Further down? One more? Uh, this is a picture of the priest where he minister in the holy place. He is holding in his hands <clears throat> an altar of, of incense and bringing it from the fire to light the altar of incense. And <clears throat> his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. So records Luke in his gospel. And the whole multitude of people were praying outside at the time of incense. And then there was this angel that appeared to him on the right side of the altar. Can we see there? <clears throat> A picture. We go back. <clears throat> ah, you see the altar there? The incense, altar of incense, right at the top. It's just at the place that separates the holy place from the holy of holies. You see the curtain there, right in front, with the cherubims, the three cherubims. Uh, that's the place that separates the holy place from the most holy place. And the altar of incense is placed right there, closest, closest uh, uh, to the, the, the throne room of God, right? just at the curtain. And it signifies, as we see in our text, the time where as the incense is being lighted, the people were praying and giving their supplications to God. And you know, the incense will flow uh, into the Holy of Holies. And then there at the mercy seat, God receives our prayers. So the Lord wants us to see a physical picture of our communion with Him. It is spiritual. But God, by His mercy, enable us to see in a very physical way how we approach God. And so there, the angel said to Zacharias the priest, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. Ah, you know, life comes from God. 
It is only by His mercy and His grace that we receive life from Him. And the angel is coming to make the announcement because there at the throne room of God, God has decreed that a man would be born. You know, our life is given by God, every one of us, and He has a perfect and good plan for each one of our lives so that, you know, we would live it victoriously and there we would shine as stars in the eternity. Receiving the rewards of God and having that fellowship with Him. And so for Zacharias, God has told him through the angel that he would have a son. That thou shalt have joy and gladness and many shall rejoice at his birth. The angel told Zacharias and the angel said to him also, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and show thee this glad tidings. So Gabriel was an archangel. He stands at the throne room of God and God sent him, as it were, to stand in the holy place to meet with men. You know, the purpose of God creating all things is that He may fellowship with, with us, that we may enjoy that life that He has with, given to us with Him. That's the whole purpose of life. And here is given to us that, that picture, that picture of God communing. So this holy place that you see, as we were mentioning, is a place of communion, is a place of fellowship between God and men. And the priest is the representative. We have seen the table of showbread over the last two weeks. We have mentioned concerning the significance of that bread not just uh, the bread that Israel by their tribe would bring to God in gratitude for His provision for them, but that they would eat that bread in the holy place with God, a picture of that fellowship that we have with God. You remember we mentioned that we chew of the bread of life, the Word of God, and that it gives us life. It gives us life. Do you chew on the Word of God? I ask that you would turn to the Gospels. And, you know, some of our Bibles are, have the words of Christ written in red. And I urge you to take time to meditate upon the words of Christ. Chew on it. That will be life to us. And the Lord wants us to, to take time to commune with Him. And so this was a picture of communion. You have the table of showbread, and then you have the candlestick. The candlestick was a picture that showed forth the life, that, the light, or the life, the spirit that God gives us. Right? The light is lit, lit up in the holy place in order that there would be uh, the possibility for the priest to minister with the help of the light in fellowship with God. So it speaks of guidance, but it also speaks of the presence of God. We mentioned of the Holy Spirit in Zechariah 4 verse 6, how when Israel was building the second temple, they were so discouraged and God gave them, gave to them this understanding that it is by the Spirit of God that supplied through the olive trees 
that gives them the power to build the temple, to build their, whole, their spiritual life, in other words. You see, when the temple was not there, worship was gone, there was no life in them. Do you realize that? If we are not connected with God, if our life is not in connection, in communion with God, there's no life in, in our living. But when we are in worship, whatever that we are doing, we are in communion with God, then it's life-giving. Whatever we do for the glory of God has an eternal implication. In other words, our life is not just for the 60, 70, 80 years of physical existence. But whatever we do with our hands, with our feet, whatever that we think and the ideas that God gives us and we put them into practice, it is for the glory of God. And God uses it. And that light is a picture, as we saw, of the church. You remember we mentioned in the book of Revelation, the seven churches were represented by the seven candlesticks. So if the light is snuffed out, our witness is gone. So for Israel, when the light is on, or it's a picture of the presence of God with His people, and that they are guided not by themselves, but by the Spirit of God. That is why we were, well, in our church camp we were studying, isn't it? The mind of the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, and how that mind of the Lord is translated to the mind of Christ. By God, we cannot see. But God sent forth His Son. We can see. And then the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit that is given to us to teach us, to grant us understanding to know the mind of God so that we may know how to live our lives, isn't it? You need the Maker's instructions. And with the Maker's instructions, our life would be full. And so you have Zacharias there, the priest taking a censer full of burning coals on the one hand from the brazen altar where the sacrifices were made and on the other hand, specially prepared sweet incense are ignited over the burning coals. And the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, verse 12 to 13, describe for us this scene. Will you turn there? Leviticus chapter 16, verses 12 to 13, to help us to see the significance of that communion that we have in God. Here he says, And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar, that's the brazen altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, bitten small, and bring it within the veil, and he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, and that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he died not. The thick cloud of smoke that curled upward, filling the tabernacle, is a symbol of that communion that the people have with God. So while Zacharias was holding the, the, <clears throat> the, the censer uh, full of burning coals, the people were praying outside. And the priest, enveloped by the sweet fragrance of the, of the incense, enjoys the blessing of that sweet communion with God. That communion. You know, incense, uh, we all know what is perfume. Right, and how the perfume uh, is able to, uh, uh, the sweet, the, the incense of the perfume right, uh, uh, sends a message, isn't it? 
uh, to us, to our senses, that we can understand the intricacies of the scent that, that we can smell in our, through, our, through the, the nostrils that God gives us. Well, it's a picture of that communion that God gives us. And the altar of incense illustrates the communion that we have with God through prayer. And the book of Exodus in chapter 30 verse 8 says, it is to be a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. The people were praying without at the time of the incense when Zacharias ministered in the holy place at the golden altar. And you know there are two altars that are connected with the tabernacle. Can we see the picture of the mat? Ah, you see there? There is the altar of sacrifice or the brazen altar that is outside in the outer court. <clears throat> and then there is, which is called the brazen altar. We're going to talk more about it. That's the place of sacrifice. And then there is the other one, which is inside, the altar of incense, which we want to focus on today. Right, that's inside, okay, inside the holy place. Uh, one that is placed outside the building in the court just before the entrance and the other inside the holy place standing just before the veil. Right? We see the picture now of the, the holy place. Uh, you see, just before the veil, the three cherubims there, uh, that's the altar of incense. Okay? So it's, uh, it's placed there before the Holy of Holies. And, <clears throat> and here uh, we see the names that are, are given to describe these altars and there are different uses right, for this particular altar. Uh, the, it is also called the, an altar uh, of <clears throat> incense, right? a place of worship. And Aaron would burn incense, sweet incense, and the altar would be used for that one purpose. Leviticus 16, verse 12 to 13. Uh, further describe for us that scene. Uh, we were at Leviticus 16. Uh, verse 12 to 13, I will read to you again, and it says here, And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, bitten small, and bring it within the veil, and he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he died not. And so here, <clears throat> you see that communion. And then uh, it's also described in Numbers 16, verse 46. Uh, Numbers 16, verse 46. That was the scene of the rebellion of Kohath. Uh, and there, uh, the Lord sent a plague. And Moses said to Aaron, take a censer and put fire thereon from off the altar, put on incense and call, go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. So here you see that there was a great connection between the two altars, the activities of the two altars, the brazen altar and the altar of incense. The incense was kindled with the fire that was first brought from the altar of sacrifice. And the priest is to be the one administering both. And here is a picture of Jesus Christ, our great high priest. How he is the one 
that was sacrificed for us, how He is the one that uh, by His broken body and His blood shed upon the altar, on the cross, how He died for us. And then He is also the high priest that is there at the right hand of the Father in heaven, praying and interceding for us. Uh, he, here is a description of his role to come before God, to bring the incense, as it were, to bring the petitions. He is our advocate. And the Lord wants us to see uh, this. We shall meditate more about it. But first, we are going to look at the pattern and the placement of it in verse 25. The pattern. How is it made? Well, and he made the verse 25 of uh, Exodus 37. The, he made the incense altar of shittim wood. The length of it was a cupid, the breadth of it was a cupid, and the height of it was a, a cupid. It is smaller than the brazen altar, 18 square inch by a meter height. A small, a small uh, uh, altar as compared with the altar of burnt offering that is outside at the courtyard, the place where the sacrifice is made, is seven and a half feet by four and a half feet by one and a half feet. And so, the, with the sacrifice being made, the fire from the, the coals from the sacrifice is taken and then is used to lead the altar of incense. Unless we have been cleansed by the blood of Christ, unless we have been, our sins have been washed by the blood of Christ, we cannot enter, as it were, into the holy place of God. And so that entering involves first, by faith, we receiving Christ. When we would repent of our sins and realize that we have no other hope, no other way out. Have you come to that realization in your life? No other way out. This is the only way. And when we come to that realization, we realize that we are in trouble. We need help. And that's where, that's where we come before God to confess our inadequacies, confess our sins before Him. And the blood of Jesus Christ washes us of our sins. And then we can approach to God. We can enter into the holy place of God. And then we can offer incense in the sense that we can have communion with God, you see. But before that, our relationship with God is broken by sin. No relationship. So by the blood sacrifice, we, come, we are able to come draw nigh to God, the priest able to go into the holy place and offer the incense, right? that communion, as it were, with God. Right? So this is the third furniture that we are looking at. And we see this uh, little incense, uh, uh, altar, small altar there, made of a clear wood and overlaid with gold. Right? Overlaid with gold. And you will notice also uh, that the blood is sprinkled upon the horns of this altar right? uh, as a way of purification. And it's significant also, how the altar is placed just before the veil. 
as you see there, which, is, which separates it from the Holy of Holies where God's throne is. So this is the closest that the priests would come to God in daily worship when they would minister at the altar of incense. So the altar of incense, when they burn the incense, the, the, the smoke will go into, uh, go, go in, go in. <clears throat> and this is the principle that God wants us to see. We, the closest we come to God is through prayer. The closest that we come to God is through prayer. So, when our sins are forgiven, right, we have communion with God. Right? We remember the first prayer that we uttered was a prayer to ask God for forgiveness of our sins. Right? Then we have communion with God. Right? That we can, through the name of Christ, speak to God. For all our needs, we come before Him. Right. And so, for the Christian, we know right, that the veil there that you see has been broken. Right. The veil has been broken. When Christ gave His uh, last, uh, uh, well, last of His life as a sacrifice, he says, it is finished. It is finished. And then the, the veil at the temple was torn open and the, the, the separation between the, the throne of God in the Ark of the Covenant was exposed, as it were. And the Lord wants us to see that this uh, golden incense or that stands before the throne of God is an everlasting testimony to the prayers of the saints as they ascend to the presence of God. Turn with me to Revelation 8 verse 3 to help us to see the connection. Revelation 8 verse 3. How is the incense altar and the smoke that comes from the incense it's a picture of the prayer of the saints, right? Revelation 8 verse 3 says, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. So this is a picture of the priest uh, holding the censer with the burning coals. And there was given unto him much incense. So he was holding the incense and then the burning coal. And he brought it that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. So it's a picture of that communion that we have with God. So each time when you pray, uh, this is a physical picture for us to see right, uh, how that prayer ascends to the, uh, uh, rises to the throne of God. Okay. Uh, so the incense is to burn perpetually before the Lord through the years. It's a picture of the believer offering prayers continually to God. So you realize that our life, once God gives us spiritual life, is a life of perpetual communion and, and fellowship with God. Do you realize that? God wants to fellowship with you. The God of heaven, the one who makes you, the one who gives you life. He wants to fellowship with you. And our life is that life of constant communion with God. That's the purpose that God made us. That constant communion that God wants us to have with Him. And so Paul says, pray without ceasing, he told the church in, Thess in Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. We are to pray. The incense is to be lighted, burned perpetually in the morning and in the twilight. In other words, 24 hours, that connection. We must each maintain 
our own altar of incense before the Lord. A continual attitude of prayer throughout the day. The Lord wants us to do so. And our Lord Himself gives us that example. He is the great high priest. Turn with me to Hebrews 7 verse 25. Hebrews 7 verse 25. It says here, Wherefore he is able, Christ, to save them, to save us, to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever maketh intercession for them. So Christ is that high priest, ascended to heaven, and he is the one praying for us. And how can we understand the, the prayer of Christ for us? How can we understand it? Well, it's spiritual. It's by the Holy Spirit. The, two, the verse that we memorized in Romans chapter 8, verse 27. Will you turn there again? I hope that we will be able to see the connection. Uh, Romans 8, verse 26 to 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. You see, this body of ours is no good. Right? It drags us down. We are in trouble. And as long as we are in this earthly tabernacle, I, we will struggle. We will have to battle with it. And so how can the believer be victorious and not live the life as an earthling? Because whatever that we would do under the sun, as Solomon would say, would be burned up, wood, hay and stubble, gone, useless life. But he wants our life to be useful for him. And so how can we be useful for God? God sent us the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. Likewise, Romans 8 verse 26 says, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. So sometimes we feel, we struggle, as it were, with temptations. The Spirit helpeth our infirmity, knows that we are weak that we can fall, we are prone to fall. For we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Spirit of God prays for us. In other words, when we are walking away from God, doing those things that are not pleasing in the sight of God, and that our life counts not for eternity, then you see here the Spirit of God, as it were, striving with the Spirit of our mind. So the Lord wants us to see that interaction. Do you feel that interaction within you? The Spirit of God within you? Well, the Lord wants you to know and he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So this is the Spirit of Christ at the right hand of the Father praying for us, you see. He maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God so that we would know what is the better way how we ought to live. So, the altar of incense specially symbolized the prayer and worship of Israel going up to God. And God's acceptance of that worship in manifesting Himself in the cloud of incense inside the tent of meeting. The tabernacle is also called the tent of meeting where God meets with His people. It would 
it will <clears throat> there you would see they would be able to see right, a picture of the cloud while they were in the tabernacle to describe the presence of God with them. Right? And that's the pattern, the biblical pattern that the Lord wants us to, to know, to see. A pattern of prayer as represented by the altar of incense, morning and evening. So we should offer our prayers of praise and petition to the Lord morning and evening. As it were, specific time right, where, you know, they had to bring the coals to make sure that the fire doesn't die it out. It requires special effort, you see. And the Bible gives us many examples of those who would rise up early in the morning for prayer. We know of Samuel's parents who would rise up early to pray, for Samuel 1 verse 19. We know of the king Hezekiah who would rise up to seek the Lord, isn't it? You know, when he was in trouble, he knew that his life was going to be gone soon. Right? He faced the war and he prayed the, to the Lord. The Lord extended his life in the ten, 10 years. God gave him more life. And then there is Job. Right? Every morning he would rise up early to pray for his children. And then there is David in Psalm 57 verse 8. Awake up, my glory, awake up, sultry and harp. I myself were awake early. And then our Lord Jesus himself in Mark 1 verse 35. How the Lord rose up early in the morning to pray. Mark 1.35 And in the morning, rising up a great while before the day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. That was the time when he would communion, commune with God, commune with his Father in heaven. And so the day begins with prayer when we would come before God, when we would seek Him for His guidance for a new day, do you do that? So sometimes we wanted to do this, but the Lord wants us to do something else. And so in our prayer time, there would be this wrestling, isn't it? The Spirit of God will show us and tell us in our, when we are doing our devotion, our quiet time, the Spirit will speak to us. Is it real for you? I say that it is very real. Each time when you read in your devotion, right, I have, for me, I have maybe about four or five different uh, devotional, but each one, you know, speaks differently and appropriate for the day. Something very amazing. Something that you cannot plan. Something that the Lord equips us when we'll take time of communion with Him. And so if we would neglect Ah, oh, then you feel very uncomfortable because you know that you are going to battle unarmed, un unequipped, not prepared. And so the psalmist says, "My soul shall be satisfied as marrow and with marrow and fatness. My mouth shall praise thee." with joyful lips, when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate upon thee in the night watches. Not only does he pray in the day, in the morning, 
but also in the evening. He would thank the Lord, he would praise him for answered prayer and the direction that God gives us for the day. So that our day is not lived, you know, out of the will of God. But the Lord wants us to live it such that it will bring forth fruit in our lives. And so our Lord not only pray in the morning, but He also pray in the night. Luke 6 verse 12, And it came to pass in those days that He went out into the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. All night in prayer. Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 12. There are some times when the Lord would uh, bring us through to commune with Him in a, in a special way. And for our Lord, it was the time when He would choose His disciples, 12 disciples, that the Lord would appoint whom he would send and he prayed continuously all night to seek the will of the Lord. Then there is Daniel who prayed three times a day in Babylon facing Jerusalem. And he would open the window and he would give thanks and he would seek the Lord. And he was, you know, a very, has a very responsible position in the kingdom. Right? He was called, he was in the, the third president. Right? All the wise men were under his charge. So he had a grave responsibility. And, you know, he was not out there all the time, but you know, three times a day he would take time to seek the Lord. Why? Because he knew that his life, life comes from him, you see. And so, here are good examples for us, and the author of incense described for us that, that communion that we have with God. And, you know, we, we also understand that the type of incense that is used for the, to the altar was important. When Israel, through the two sons of Aaron, offered strange incense, it was described for us how fire came out to devour them. And so we need to come to God. We need to pray in the will of God. And how can we do so? Well, through the Word of God. We need to take time to, to meditate and study the word of, word of God so that our prayer life will be conformed to the pattern that is set forth by God in His Word. And so... Uh, it's also described how in the Old Testament, Aaron would make atonement upon the horns of the altar once a year with the blood of the sin offerings of the atonements. Once in a year shall he make atonement upon it throughout the generations. In other words, set it apart, sacred, sacred. And we also notice the horns of the altar of incense were not just for decoration, right? It is with regard to the blood sacrifice. On the Day of Atonement, the tenth day of the seventh month, the high priest would take the blood 
some of the blood from the altar and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and put it upon the horns of the altar of incense to make atonement upon the horns of it. And the purpose of this act was to cleanse it and to hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Leviticus 16, verse 18 to 19, it says here, And he shall go out upon the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and shall take the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about and he shall sprinkle the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallowed it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So the altar was a representative of a place of intercession before the Lord. And when the blood from the sin offering was sprinkled upon the horns, it symbolized a prayer for the pardon of sin before God. Right. How we need to pray for pardon of sin. And so with the pardon, well, we can come before God with that boldness. And it opens up for us the way to come before God at His throne of grace, to find mercy and grace in times of need. So when we pray, uh, we need to seek God, confess our sins before Him, uh, before we would draw near to Him. And there is the hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer, which we have sung, that describes for us so wonderfully, clearly, uh, that communion that we have with God. And I would urge you to, uh, to study this hymn. Uh, we don't have, we uh, are running out of time. The author of incense, the Lord wants us to learn uh, what was the pattern and the placement, what was the purpose as a perpetual incense before the Lord, as a perfume incense to the Lord. So our prayers to God uh, ascend to Him as a sweet sever sacrifice, and our praise to God our worship of God. It speaks of that relationship. It's a beautiful picture of communion and devotion of believers with their God. And may we appropriate it in our lives. The more we take time with our devotion, the more we take time to commune with God in whatever that we do, right, that that communion that, that is, is clearly uh, that lifeline for our every action, for every word, for every activity, that indeed when we have lived this life, uh, we may say that we have run the race. And it's time for us to meet with the Lord. May we, may we have that, that understanding. And may our lives indeed be fragrant, beautiful. And may He bless the lives of each one of His children represented here for His honour and for His glory so that our life indeed will count for eternity. May the Lord help us. Let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. Strengthen us by Thy Holy Spirit and illumine, instruct, teach us. Grant us 
understanding so that we may indeed thrive in our communion with Thee, that blessed fellowship that we have with Thee, O Lord. Strengthen Thy people and bless our daily uh, communion, our daily time of prayer, that it may redound to Thy glory. Strengthen us, this I pray with thanksgiving, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.